بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم It uh, goes without saying that uh, it's a great honor and a great privilege, man, to be here this evening. Um, we're still covering this book, Matharatul Qulub, the Purification of the Hearts. The joy of this session, though, for me, is contained in the fact that we get to cover each chapter in conversation. So the flow of information and the flow of instruction is never unidirectional. It's not just me talking uh, to people that attend the class, but rather I get to have a conversation with a different guest every week and I get to learn along with everybody else. And the space is absolutely open for anybody who wants to chime in, index something into the conversation, contribute something to the conversation. Um, I really enjoy this, man. So this week I have Omer Hasib, mashallah, uh, um, um, a brother that I've known for some time man, and to see his maturation, his development as a scholar, as a thinker, as a man, uh, he never ceases to make me proud, man. I remember this guy when he was, I'm, I'm, dating, I'm, I'm dating myself by saying this, but when he was just in high school, really, man, when you started coming around the community. And I remember when you initially planned to travel abroad and study Islam, and that all of that has now come to fruition, and you're in the community, and you're serving the community as a teacher. Uh, it's really an honor to, to share this platform with you, man. How are you? I'm good, Habib. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm just riding your coattails, man. Alhamdulillah. No, no, it's no. It's nice no, to be no. hiding behind you. No, it's not Allah wa rahmatullahi wa You know. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will not accept any you, you false, already, No, 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 it's false true. Humility. Everybody, it's not even, the whole community knows it. The, uh, the pillar that you are for our community. This is when that. you try to give someone no, praise no. and it backfires. You <laughs> see, it's coming. So let's stop this right here. The chapter for today um, is negative thoughts, mm. right? Negative thoughts. When you hear the expression, even before we look at the words of Imam Maulud, what what are some things that come to mind when you think negative thoughts? Initial impressions. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, um, negative thoughts, man. That's you know that's an agitational question because you got to think about yourself too much. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You got to think about the last like hour or two, mm. or the last day, and you got to do this thing of taking yourself to account. It's tough because the first thing you want to think about is Satan, because that's where negativity comes from, or that we're supposed to believe that's where it comes from, all negativity. But mm -hmm. then we never really think about our ego at all as much, mm -hmm. you know, because our ego doesn't, for some reason, it won't let you even think about negative thoughts and connect it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And then it's really about you be negative. Th I think in this context, if I'm, if I'm correct, is comparing yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. This idea of comparison, of like suspicion, of insecurity, mm -hmm. of um, a sense of just not being in a state of peace mm -hmm. with what you have right now because of very, being very concerned about what the intentionality of other people are around you, right? Um, it's a very, uh, it's a slippery slope, I think where it gets to, it takes you to a really dark place to embrace negative thoughts. That I think at some level, uh, Allah knows best is that um, this thing that we do called worship, these things that we do called purification, and purification of the heart, um, at the core of it, it is to begin with removing all negative thoughts, if mm. possible. Mm. Because how can one get tranquility if they have negativity inside of themselves, right? So, I mean, what do you, what do you, what, 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 what really- <laughs> When I think it? about, negative thoughts, I think about what in Arabic is termed sulban, mm. right? To have a bad opinion of someone when the person is deserving of the benefit of the doubt. Mm. And I think that the real 
um, danger of sulban is not that you unintentionally hold someone in contempt this, that does not deserve to be held in contempt is that you bring upon yourself a cynical outlook. Mm. You know, I think about that hadith of the Prophet وسلم, when he was walking with Safiya, anha, his wife, and they passed by two men right. in Medina right. on the street, and it was late, it was after Maghrib, so it's dark, right? One of the things that you have to remember about the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, a simple thing, but something that ironically, no pun intended, illuminates a lot. They did not have electricity. They did not have electricity. So when you read the hardest prayers on the munafiqun, the hardest prayers on the hypocrites are Isha, the night prayer in Fajr, the dawn prayer. The explanation given by Imam an nawawi it's dark in the masjid. No one is going to see you there. You see, a very simple explanation. If you're praying Fajr or you're praying Isha, it's dark. So if your goal is Yura'un to be seen, you want to attend what? Salat al Jummah, Salat al Dhuhr, Salat al Asr, Salat al Maghrib, right? The afternoon prayer, the late afternoon prayer, the sunset prayer, so everybody can see, hey, there goes so and so. But at night, no one is going to recognize you anyway. Right? So it's dark outside. And they see the Prophet وسلم, walking with the shadowy figure that they know is a woman, but they can't really um, tell the identity of the woman. And the Prophet وسلم, rushes to them and he says, I just want you to know this woman that I'm walking with, this is my wife, Sophia. And they're shocked, like, Ya Rasulullah, we would never think anything untoward about you. We would never think that this was something that wasn't above board. And the Prophet والسلام, said, I'm just reminding you, Inna shaytana yajrifikum dam, because Satan flows through each of you like blood. Mm. This hadith has a lot in it. One thing that people never talk about is that the Prophet ﷺ actually mentioned the flow of blood in the human being. When that was not common knowledge at that time, that blood actually flowed in human beings. The second thing that I've come to dispute though, is most explanations of this hadith maintain that the Prophet was sticking up for his own reputation, hmm. right? You'll read like the, the rulings developed from this narration yeah. and they say the permissibility of sticking up for yourself, the permissibility of, of, of clearing your name if your name is involved in something doubtful. So if somebody thinks maybe you have, you know, the option of saying, no, it wasn't what you think, but I think something deeper was happening there. And I've asked teachers about this and they say, we don't find this in traditional explanations, but I think your explanation, Ubaid, is credible. Mm. I think the Prophet وسلم, was less interested in protecting his reputation and more interested in protecting their faith. That's right. You see? Mm. One of the things that I absolutely cringe at is whenever somebody of religious standing is revealed to have committed some indiscretion, mm. and it's usually sexual in nature. It's salacious. Right, it's usually salacious in nature. You fear what? There's going to be a backlash and people will begin to lose their faith. Mm. I've had friends and teachers that were accused of sexual misconduct. Some of them were proven guilty and people lost their Iman. Mm. And I'm always thinking, what? like, how did that happen? Why does that happen? That if we learn that so-and-so was uh, guilty of sin or guilty of crime right. or guilty of abuse, for some people, the faith cannot be believed in anymore. Why do you think that is? The simple answer is that, you know, uh, your heart and your faith gets connected to that personality. That person um, who in some level is, and this is one of the things, you know, there's one God, many prophets. 
there is multiple madhahib, there is a plurality of our tradition, and there's mm -hmm. no really single um, sort of entitled path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards God, towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to understanding it. You have multiple schools, you have multiple creeds, credences, um, and you have multiple conduits and people in your lives that lead you to God, whether they're people that are wholly good or holistically bad or somewhere in between, which is a vast majority of human beings. Um, to give human beings, I think, this level of like divinity. And we don't really call it that. And we do come from the culture of sometimes, perhaps, I mean, we're in, listen, we're, we're in like, we, we buy Jordans and if he touched it, we put it on top of the fireplace. <laughs> I never did that. But, you know what I'm saying? Right, I mean, I collective. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, that's right. Like, if you have, uh, you, we come from a culture of if, uh, you know, um, if 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 Michael Jackson dropped his glove that he wore, people would keep it and it's a prized possession. Sure. That there is a, sometimes we call like a deification of human beings. Mm -hmm. And we just come from that. And sometimes that seeps its way into Islam and we start to connect our religious outlook onto a single person, which is number one, not fair. Mm -hmm. Number one, not fair. Number two, it, the Prophet doesn't even do that. Mm -hmm. The Prophet peace be upon him doesn't even claim that, right? Mm -hmm. Say I'm a human being like you, you have right? You mm have -hmm. Ilayya, right? That revelation was sent upon me, but your Lord is one Lord. Meaning he doesn't really call to himself, but, but recognizing the immense re responsibility of prophethood. I see something else. Uh. I see something else. Huh. Through actually conversing with people who experienced these crises, these crises of faith, after you know some uh, religious figure uh -huh. is either accused of some wrongdoing or proven to have committed some act of wrongdoing, I think that the problem is really negative thoughts. And let me explain what I mean. They see the person, and because the person is guilty of some sin, they believe what? The person never believed in, in Islam. Person. And if this person, with their knowledge, their level of practice, if they don't really believe in this, then it must not be true. How can I believe in it? I've never studied. Mm. I'm not associated with mashayikh, and I don't speak Arabic. I don't read a uh, hizb of Quran every day. He does all of that and he can still commit a sin like that. He can still treat a woman like that. This deen must not be right. real. And what I, I actually wrote an article about even, and this is sometimes controversial because people think that I'm saying people don't have to be held accountable. No, everyone must be held accountable. Our deen is a deen of accountability. If someone committed an act of wrongdoing, there has to be some restorative justice, right? And if we as a community deem the person unfit for their position in the community, they should be removed. But just because the person sinned does not mean that they are pathologically inclined towards sin. You know, my grandmother used to say to me, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That was always a cold shot. <laughs> you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That sometimes these people that we revere, they actually began the path toward that sin, mm -hmm. intending to do something good. And at some point, shaitan, their frailty, their weakness intervened. And that intention to do good became something bad. You see, I think sometimes we think, and I think that it's very popular um, to use terms like grooming. And I'm not saying that, you know, people that are pathologically um, um, intent or inclined toward abuse don't groom people, they do groom people. But sometimes I think the individual is actually trusting themselves. Oh, I'm just gonna go over and help this person learn how to read sort of the fact. Yeah. We'll sit in the lobby of the building. Yeah. And then the person says, okay, they bid them farewell and they leave. And then they say, I wonder if she really got it. I wonder if she, you know, cause I know Arabic can be a tough language for non-Arabic speakers. Maybe I'll go upstairs to the apartment and see if she can recite it one more time. 
I'll ask her if she wants me to make a voice recording on the phone. Mm. And he knocks on the door and says, I was about to leave and I realized I never made a voice recording on the phone. The intention is still good. Right. Then he, then he's, he says, but it, it would be kind of awkward for me to like do the voice recording outside in the hallway. Maybe I can come in. Right. Right. Then he enters the apartment. Now at every step he was wrong. Mm. I'm not, I'm not exculpating. Mm. I'm not explaining away. At every step he was wrong. Maybe visiting that young sister with no one with him. He was wrong. Going up to the apartment, he was wrong. Entering the apartment, he was wrong. But it wasn't that as he was doing this, I, I don't even really believe in Islam. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting that you say that because the Quran never says, never follow the devil. It says, Don't follow don't these follow gradual the steps. steps. Don't, don't follow gradual the, pro the pro protocol. Don't gradual the process. You know what I'm saying? It's a very gradual process. As you know, there's many traditions about stories of people that have slipped up in our tradition. We're very divine people. Or sorry, sorry, like righteous people, mm -hmm. right? Who are very, you know, the story of Ar Barsisa, which I won't get into, you could, if you'd like to, but... There is a there are these there are these like gradual footsteps, right? Um, it 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 reminded me of this I, this tradition of I was commanded to judge what's in the outward, and Allah deals with what is in the matters of your heart. So outwardly, we have a complete right to be like, no, this something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. But you don't have to conclude Somebody's that the faith. person That's that right. the person doesn't really believe yeah. in this. Mm. And if you didn't conclude that the person doesn't really believe there would be no reason for you to disbelieve. Yeah. But the only reason you're arriving at the conclusion that I can't really believe in this anymore is because in the person's sin, you've assumed what? They never had any faith. Mm. They were a complete charlatan. Right. This was a complete act. And my experience counseling people that have you know, fallen into grave error is that these are not people of unfaith. That's right. These are people sometimes that are too trusting of themselves that end up falling into error. Who even after committing that error still have great faith, mm -hmm. but maybe need help, maybe need to be removed from their uh, position, maybe need to be prosecuted criminally. Right. I'm not talking about accountability, right. but negative thoughts, right. the real victim of negative thoughts is you. You see, and it's sometimes it's not even just Muslims. I cringe even when I hear about the pastor right. or the reverend or the rabbi that is guilty of some kind of financial mal mal malfeasance or because what it suggests to people is what? Nobody really believes this stuff. Even the people that are the outward representatives of this tradition, they don't even really believe this stuff. So how can I believe it? Mm. And it's that cynicism so when I see the Prophet والسلام, rushing to these men saying, no, this is my wife. I think he's worried about if they think that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is creeping. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is out at night with a woman he's not married to. What does that do to their iman? Mm. It destroys their iman. You see? Mm. It destroys their iman. Mm. And this is why he's telling them, no, no, this is my wife. I want you to know that I am completely faithful to everything that God revealed. Right? And I just think that's subhanAllah. That's beautiful, man. No, subhanAllah. That's beautiful. Imam Maulud begins, some assumptions are not permissible, such as holding a bad opinion about someone who manifests righteous behavior. Mm. What do you think about that? Why, why would we hold a bad opinion of someone and we're not even talking about somebody that the case is unknown. Right. We're talking about someone that everything you see from her, everything you see from him is righteous. But there's some disease in our hearts that we would still see this person as insincere or a show off or ostentatious or a seeker of reputation. What is that in us? I think you already named it. Um, you called it disease. But what is it, you know, there's this, there's this really uh, interesting hadith that always trips me up because, you know, like when, you, uh, when you're around, sometimes the, the networks are in, you always hear about how bad everything is right now. 
man, people, man, Muslims are not like they used to be, man. Man, we, go, we gotta go back to the, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're not, people don't got their deen tight no more. People don't even, they ain't it's serious, cool. man. People ain't serious no more, right? People, you keep hearing this thing of like, people aren't serious, you know what I'm saying? And the Prophet Sallallahu says, if qala rajulun halakin nas, if somebody says people are damned, they're the most damned amongst them. Mm, that's deep. He's the most damned amongst them. That's deep. That's a, how that's can deep. you yeah. go into yeah. that? Go into that. Yeah. How could you, where does your heart have to be? How could you do this thing called life, called da'wah to invite people? How can you practice? How could you be part of community if everybody's, and, and who's really, and if that's your default, if that's your default, that's, that's your fitrah. That's scary, man. That's your fitrah. Like, how do you wake up in the morning and you're like, yes, you know, everybody, screw everybody. You know, you, I mean, like, you, you have popular Muslim movements. Movements that are based on that. That are based on based the on idea that. that the vast majority of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is engaged in shirk. Like, how, how do you uh, rest with that idea that all of these people that say they are Muslims, they're really bad wal mudil. That's right. They're misguided and misguiding. It's like, yeah. really? Yeah. You know, I mean, subhanAllah, you know, the old saying is that the pitcher, I mean, the, the, the glass pitcher, only spills out what it contains. That's right. And that if you see somebody and you think, ah, she's just showing off. Ah, he's doing this for the sake of his reputation. It's probably because you do things you for do the things sake of your reputation. reputation. Right? You do know. things to show off. Right. It takes one to know one. So to harbor a negative thought about anybody, mm. right? That you think I'm better than them, yeah. right? The Prophet ﷺ said, "Man kana inda qalbihi mithqalu darratan min al kibr la yadkhulu al jannah." Whoever has even an atom's weight of arrogance in their enter. heart will not enter jannah. That's right. And a man from the Sahaba, radiallahu an, he spoke up and said. يا رسول الله ولكن الرجل يحب أن يكون ثوبه حسنا ونعله حسنا هل هذا من الكبر؟ O Messenger of God, but a man loves to wear nice clothing and he loves to wear nice shoes. Right. Is this from kibr? And this was very deep to me. It was deep to yeah. Because you know, I think we often think that arrogance and about, right? conceit are the same as vanity. Right. right. When we see a person that is very particular about their appearance, yeah. our suggestion is sometimes, and it's an evil suggestion, uh, this person is, is arrogant. Is there, when there's a hadith about that too. And, and the prophet responded, what? Inna Allah jameelun wa yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. Walakin al kibr, but arrogance, batrul haq, rejecting the truth, batr, which is a, which is a strong Arabic word. Right, to reject truth when it's to presented to you, yeah. right? To slap to down slap the truth down. out of arrogance. When I think butter, the kind of people, and God saved me from being among them, that can't admit wrongdoing. Yeah. The kind of people that can't apologize. Dressing very nicely is not a sign of arrogance. Being unable to apologize is a sign, a sign of, of arrogance. Of That's right. I know some people, man, they have like very elaborate ways of apologizing without apologizing. I'm sorry you took offense to what I said. Huh? <laughs> you know, it's like the, the famous scene in uh, Gone with the Wind. I'm sorry the truth offends you, Mr. Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, I'm sorry that, no, no, I was wrong. Being able to say that, mm -hmm is actually a safeguard against arrogance. I was wrong. I was, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I didn't know that saying such a thing would offend you. I was wrong, I'm sorry. And then he said, nas, looking down at people, looking down your nose at people to look at someone and mm -hmm. I'm better than them. I'm more pious. Yeah. I'm more talented. You know, there's a, <clears throat> there's this, um, the, the, there's this, you know, uh, Sayyidina Luqman gives his son this advice in the Quran. He says, oh, my son, you know, call to good and forbid evil. <inaudible> these, are, these are very tough things. And then he says, which is something that we've all are attempting to sign up for. <inaudible> so hold strong to the prayer. 
right? Call to good and forbid evil and, and be patient. But he says that, and something really interesting, the next verse. Don't scorn your cheek away at people. Mm. Like, don't do this at people. Which I'm like, this is an interesting way of rephrasing, rephrasing that. Absolutely. Right? Don't walk on this earth boastfully. Allah does not like the self conceit of boasting. You know what's interesting, man? Uh -huh. The word swagger in the English language, and I'm like Sheikh Ahmed, I'm a word nerd. I love words, I love language. The word swagger used to mean to strut boastfully. Uh -huh. Or falif, to that was swagger, right? right? To walk boastfully. Now, swagger, thank you, Aaron. Swagger has been reinvented to mean confidence, mm. right? A person, this, yeah. a person that has swagger, we mean a person that has confidence. But that verse of Sayyidina Luqman right. is don't walk in a, a, a strutting, boastful way. Kind of like George Jefferson. That y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Tarpino George Jefferson, man. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, right. But this idea of turning your cheek to somebody, as if you know, ah, you disgust me. Yeah. Right. One of the wisdoms of Lung Command that he gives his son: don't do that to people. Yeah. You disgust me. Yeah. Right. You're, you're under me. But here, Imam Maulu continues to elaborate. This means that your heart is convinced and you have judged this person based on your heart's suspicions without proof that warrants such an assumption. Mm. SubhanAllah. You know, Kimat, soul done is a disease, man. right? And sometimes we can fall into it unwittingly. We don't even recognize what we're doing. Mm. You know, I've told this story many times, but when I was once coming down 47th Street and I saw someone that I know, right, coming out of Benny's, which is, uh, Benny's is a, 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 a beverage depot. <laughs> it's, a be it's a beverage depot. You don't ask so many questions. <laughs> it's a beverage depot. <laughs> And they had what appeared to be a cylindrical bottle. With apple juice in it. And it was in a bag. And when I drove past, I said, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. And just then, the idea that this person purchased wine mm. and that they consumed wine had already rooted itself in my heart. Oh. I didn't even know. What? I couldn't see the label, couldn't, didn't talk to the person. I'm driving down the street. I see the person coming from Benny's and I had already jumped to all of these conclusions. Hell, I was about to call Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is where Shaitan can take you. That's right. You're ready to get brothers together for an intervention. Ahi, man. Ah, man, you think about your kids. <laughs> Think about my kids. Ah, man, for real, bro. What, is it something I did? Are you under pressure? Is it the job? Is it stress? What is it, man? Are you reading those medical reports that say red wine extends your life? That's a lie, man. It's all written, man. I go home. I tell my wife. Now, I'm backbiting. Mm -hmm. We're taking this one step further. Baby, you ain't going to believe what I just saw. <laughs> So and so, he's an alcoholic, man. I don't, I don't, I don't, this is where Shaitan can take you. That's right. The brother, brother's an alcoholic. My wife looked at me and said it was probably olive oil. Mm. You know, olive oil comes in bottles like that too. I said, Benny's doesn't sell olive oil. <laughs> yeah. But the point was, that was Husn Dhan. That's right. But she like, when did you go to Benny's? What is it? Was yeah. she like, when did you go to Benny's? No, I was driving back. I was driving back. No, no, no. I was saying, how do you know Benny's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah, yeah. But, but I said, but yeah, I don't know what Benny's you know. said. <laughs> but the, 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 the fact that she taught me so gently in mm. that moment mm -hmm. what we're supposed to do, it was probably olive oil. Yeah. You know, olive oil is sold in bottles like that too. Even when people commit obvious sins, you know what the ulama say about that? 
you should actually maintain that they didn't have a knowledge that that was wrong. Yeah. That's what you should say. Yeah. You see somebody doing something is clearly wrong. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. man, he must, you know, he, said, he, must, he, must, he, must, he must be unaware. They said Imam Rafa'i's knowledge was so vast that if he saw people doing things that were explicitly haram, he would know a situation and that that haram would otherwise be halal. Yes, I've heard this too. Yeah. You know, they say, Men qalla ilmuhu kathura in kathura in Right? The, 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 the less the knowledge, the more the censure, the more the right. blame, the more the yeah. inkar, yeah. the more the uh, yeah. uh, 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 pointing fingers and assigning blame. But the greater the knowledge, the greater the permissiveness. Well, you know, maybe. You know, maybe, you know, maybe, Allah 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 maybe, Allah maybe there's some medical issue there. You know, yeah. sometimes certain substances that are otherwise yeah. impermissible become permissible when you use them for medical purposes. Or, I mean, I've seen even things you think that Muslims commonly know. Like a person that has a legitimate excuse not to fast does not have to fast, right? Nursing women, pregnant mm -hmm. women, um, people, people that are, are diabetic, people, are diabetic, yeah. people that are diabetic, uh, people that anyone that receives a physician's instructions that fasting might be harmful for you. But a person might see them at a restaurant. I hate to inform you, I, you know, brother so and so, he left Islam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, he, he left Islam? He renounced his shahada? Nah, I man, I, I didn't hear nothing like that, but <laughs> so I'm sitting at Epic, man, middle of the day, Ramadan, man. I'm like, ah, he's diabetic. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. It's like, yeah. it's, you know, why did I think of that, right? <laughs> why did I think, I think of that? that? You know, you know, Shoei, there's, there's a story because I never really understood. I never really understood this thing until um, there's a story from. Oh, sorry, sorry. Bismillah. There's a story from uh, that was not subtle at all. Like, no. oh, you, you should have just yelled. Wait, you, you, some, you whispered yo, small over there. Yo, yo, you know what? Man? I've never seen somebody whisper across a room, man. <laughs> that man said, "Yo, oh man, oh man, you should come on, baby." Hello, <laughs> Akbar. Hello, Akbar. I mean, you, yeah. you bring life to this space, man. You know, everybody yeah. just take a minute and just pray for Amir Felt and his I family. Know. And matter of fact, we, a round of applause for my man, Amir Felt, man. <laughs> I'm doing that. You know, I'm doing that. Oh, look, mm -hmm. serves this space tirelessly, Masha man. Masha Allah. You know, indefatigable in his work, man. Always here, making sure everything is set up, everything is going well. MashaAllah. Masha Allah. I'm sorry. I'm doing that. There was, a, there was a story of, um, uh, a scholar from Hadramaut, where, 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 where you were mm -hmm. for a period, mm -hmm. and from the Saqaf family, which mm -hmm. is a great family of scholars, very, very great family of scholars. And the father, the son studies with his father for about 30 years. He's studying with his father. 30 years he's studying with him. And the father tells him, you know, I have a final test for you. You're done. You're graduated. I have the final test when this, you're done. And he said, go out, go out. And he said, he said, Wajid ahad aswa minka. Find somebody that's worse than you, that's lower than you. Go find somebody that's lower than you. So the first thing he does is he walks out and he finds a young child who's openly recalcitrant to his parents. Mm -hmm. And he said, Wallahi kuntu fi birrul waride. That he said, I, I've never dealt with my parents. I've always been righteous to my parents. I've never done stuff like this with mm -hmm. my parents. You know, and sometimes you see kids behaving with their parents and you're like, man, if I did that, man, if I did that, my mother never lets me forget. No, you did. You know, you did that. You did that. You know what I'm saying? This is scar not, you don't, you know, uh, and um, he's about to go, you know, decide for himself that this, I found somebody that's worse than me, but he recognized who he's younger than me, which means that what? He has less sin than I have. He hasn't sinned as much as I have because he's not mukallaf, he's not responsible. And then he spends a day and he finds a thief. This is a true story. He finds a thief. And he says, Wallahi lam asraq fi hayati. I've never stolen nothing in my life. I've never stolen anything in my life. And he sees a thief. He's about to decide. He sees a thief go behind a tree with a fairly large bark and walk the other way. And he said, perhaps when he was behind the tree, Allah, Allah. he sought repentance from Allah and Allah 
uh, forgave him. And then he comes across an elderly man, a man, and if I'm very explicit, who was in the business of, of prostitution and, and, and alcohol. Who's, and he said, Na'udhu Billah, I've never done something like this. This, this, like this is it. Like this is it. I've never done this joint. Like I could say, but this, but then he remembered, this is an elderly man. That if he was older than me, he worshipped Allah longer than I have worshipped Allah. Mm. Regardless of what he did, he worshipped God longer than I worshipped God. Mm. And he begins to cry and he says, I failed, I failed, I haven't found anybody worse than me. What's, you know, na'udhu billah, like this. And he comes home and on the way home, he finds a dead carcass of a dog. And he says, alhamdulillah, I have found something that is worse than me. Mm. Right? This is jifat al-kalb, this dead carcass of a dog. He puts it on his shoulder and then he remembers the verse. Ya laytani kuntu turaba. Mm. Oh, that I wish there's going to come a day that I wish that I was dirt. I wish I was a dead carcass of this mm. dog. And he tells his father, he says, my father starts crying. He said, I failed, I fell, I failed. I haven't found anybody worse. What, what are you trying to show me? I found the young kid who was recalcitrant, the thief, the pimp. I found a dog, a dog. And I realize I'm, I have a lower station than this dog. And the father looks at him, he removes his turban, he puts it on his head, and he said, now you're ready to be a teacher. Allah. Now you're ready to teach. Allah. Meaning, our business is not necessarily of degrading ourselves, but to esteem other people around us. Allah. You know, I heard a similar story, except in the story that I heard, the last encounter was with a non-Muslim. And he said, huwa ya'asillaha an jahlin. <laughs> this person disobeys God, but perhaps does not know any better. I disobey God and I know better. Mm. So even this person is better than me. But your point about esteeming other people, there are great secrets in esteeming other people. Okay, man? You know, I, I have teachers that when they see me, they give me praise that right. they know I'm not deserving of and I know I'm not deserving of. Oh, there's Sheikh Ubaid Allah. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, man, you know I'm a straight up imposter. <laughs> you, you know I'm a straight up imposter. But, but, one of the secrets of holding people in high esteem is that they actually aspire to realize the esteem that you hold them in. Mm. Right? And one of the secrets, unfortunately, of holding people in low esteem is that they don't aspire to be more. That's right. This person already thinks so. You know, it, ironically, man, Mike Tyson, bro. Mike Tyson. Yeah. Hikma, Hikma Tysonia, yani. Right. Mike, Mike Tyson is being interviewed, and he says some very lewd things to the interviewer. And you could tell that she was taken aback by this. She's like, oh my God, Mike, what? He said, nah, I actually don't believe any of that, but I mean, you think I'm a dirtbag anyway, so even if I said nice things, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, when people know you have a bad opinion of me anyway, for some people, it destroys their incentive to try harder, mm. especially young people. Naturally. 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 Don't ever, it, so it's almost like, um, you know, one of my good friends, we were talking about parenting. And he gave me some advice. He said, you know, no matter what, never get on your children too much. Because at some point they decide, what? I'm not good at this. I'm just, and that becomes the identity. I am the Badmash. I am that guy. I am the Walid Musharib. I am that guy. And you want them to strive. And then I thought about the hadith of the Prophet, alayhi wasalam, that Anna said what? The prophet never said to me, oof. He never, he never, 10 years, ten years I served him. He never said to me a word of blame. That's right. He never said to me because of anything I did, why did you do this out of frustration? Yeah. He never said to me concerning anything I neglected, why didn't you do this out of frustration? Yeah. Right. So that Ennis can what? See himself in, 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 in a very positive in a very light. Positive way. Yeah. And then strive to be how the messenger of God saw him. There was, yeah, there was a tradition. Let none of you constantly find faults in your brother. For indeed, you will end up corrupting them. 
-hmm. meaning the environment that you've created for them not to heal, not to grow, not to be the best version of who they can possibly be, um, and not even see any self-worth in themselves. You're gonna make the, you're gonna you're gonna push them away. Now, I wanna I wanna get to what is on everybody's minds, right? Right. Yo, man, let's get real, because Imam Maulud is about to get real. Right. Yes, this is a good talk. It's inspiring. It's motivational. You know, two guys sitting on stage talking about seeing the good in everybody. But yo, when we really see things from people yeah. that warrant suspicion, right? Or we experience things from people that warrant suspicion. We should be concerned. How do we deal with that? Let's look at how Imam Maulud addresses it. And then I'd like to uh-huh. get some of your commentary, maybe add some nuance to right. this very uh, Ren and Stimpy, right. happy, happy, joy, joy space that we've been creating. Get a little bit real, <laughs> inshallah. Imam Maulud says, there's nothing wrong with having doubts about someone or having a bad opinion of him if it is based on sound reasoning and is not arbitrary. Right. What scenarios can you think of where it might be okay to have a bad opinion of someone? I don't know about specific scenarios. Okay. That might be given too much away. Um, I mean, I would have to really think, you know, <laughs> I have to very think very uh very deeply um because what I can say to that I think is we know that you know in the mu'min la yahba a believer doesn't get stung by the same snake hole twice mm-hmm. you know or a believer doesn't degrade themselves that you don't put your that for, unfortunately and this is really big unfortunately we're taught in our tradition, that forgiveness means to trust that person again and to holistically let them back in your life again. Forgiveness simply means you have nothing from what they've done that you would hold them accountable for in your heart. But it doesn't mean that you're not aware. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you're passive. It doesn't mean you, you know, now you have to be, because of unfortunately this allegation of just forgiving and forgetting, right? Or this, and if you don't do that, you're not a good Muslim. You're not a good, like, you have to do that. That's, the high, that's not necessarily the case. You know, even Imam Mawlud talks about the verse in the Quran, mm-hmm. if a transgressor comes to you with, a, with, a, with the news, clarify it, right? Clarify it for perhaps you will... Um, you'll, through your ignorance, you will oppress your people or you'll mistake your people. And from what you've done, you'll become from what you've done, somebody of regret. That person in that verse, the tafsir, the fasik is not a fasik, he's a sahabi. Mm-hmm. He's a sahabi. Mm-hmm. He's a very righteous sahabi, right? But he's telling the Prophet وسلم, and the companions that there's an army that is ready to attack. Mm-hmm. And that puts the believers in a very vulnerable state. But he didn't clarify where he got that news from. So the act of not clarifying in of itself and not being very aware of like where you're getting your news from, where you're getting your message from, in of itself is an act of fist. It's an act of transmission. There's a, there's, there's, there's a couple scenarios that I think are very relevant to our community. And because this precept, mm. I've had to ask teachers about this over and over again because I wanted to really understand it. And one of the things that I took from my, my, you know, uh, their counsel that I, um, I usually teach in this chapter, there's two kinds of wrongdoing. Some acts of wrongdoing, a person is only harming themselves. Yeah. Right. He, 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 the person is only harming you know, themselves. And to have a bad opinion of them probably will not uh, account too much. It won't, it won't account for much. It's much better, actually, to think about how you can help them, mm. how you can be there for them. And then there's an act of wrongdoing in which a person is harming other people, right? And you have to take a strong stance in the name of justice. We can't let you do that. We have to be wary of you. So if someone steals or someone is 
selling fake insurance policies or something like right. that. Or better yet, someone has a proven track record of domestic violence in our community. Right? Remember the hadith of the Prophet A woman comes to him, anha. She says, I have two suitors, yeah. right? Seeking my hand in marriage. Tell me what you know about them, right? The Prophet والسلام, says, as for the first man, he's very poor. He's very poor. So if you marry him, prepare for a life of economic hardship. Even if he pretends as though he's a person of means, he's lying. Mm. Right? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this, I'm like, man, people used to front even back then. They probably rented a camel and everything. Yeah. Pull up on the joint. Look, <laughs> baby, I'm rolling out here, man. <laughs> You know, I, money, oh man, I don't even sweat the Falouz gang. <laughs> I'm good on the money side, baby. I don't even worry about that. You, you, can, you can care for me if we get married. Oh yeah, care for you. Some will spoil you. <laughs> Are you kidding me? First time they get married, she goes out. I'm thinking about getting cheese on my burger. Wait a minute, baby. Wait a minute, wait a minute, baby. <laughs> wait a minute, baby. All this extravagance, it just... You know, I live a very minimalist lifestyle. You know, he's poor. And the second man, he is a heavy handed, abusive man. He's a man with a stick. He's a man with a stick. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an abusive man. He's not a gentle man. One of the things about this that I always thought was very interesting was that there was no bro code. Man. You know, many of us have been placed in that position, but I don't think we've engaged with the same level of integrity. Mm. Right, a woman. What do you know about this person? Oh, he's he's a good dude. He's a he's solid. Mm -hmm. Is he solid? If it was your daughter, that's right. Would you want someone to just give you a flipping answer and say, "Oh yeah, he's solid. Yeah, he's he's a good guy. Yeah, he's solid." Yo, I mean, you, it's better to say what I I really don't have a lot of experience with the person. Yeah. And if you have negative experiences with the person. You're actually duty bound in that situation to say, I've had some negative interactions with him, you know, nothing that would, you know, remove him as a, a candidate yeah. for marriage. Yeah. But I mean, I've, I've in seen that, some In that things. regard, unfortunately, sometimes we go like, you know, hey, how's that? How's that brother for, for you know, how's that brother for marriage? That's a super marriage. Like, yeah, you know, I'm the other, they're good people, but you know, they have a, they're going through some stuff, you know, they're going through <laughs> some stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what are you going through? It's like, yeah, man, they're just, you know, uh, they're, they're just working on themselves. Right? They need some time. You know, they have a, they got a, they, they got an issue. That's like a very polite way of yeah. saying, yeah, he's a sociopath. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, a, sociopath. he's a psychopath. Yeah. Or, you know, and, and, or sometimes they'll actually <laughs> say, you know, uh, say, say the thing, you know, what man right now, um, he actually, he got fired, man. He can't, he's not ready for marriage or something. Mm -hmm. And that's where you got to stop. Yeah, you, but sometimes what happens? You go far. You go, yeah, man, he's fire, man. He's ugly as hell, dog. I'm telling you, dog. No, I've dude, never. I don't man, know what kind of friend you get. You, I, hey, I, I, hey, I never heard that like that. Is his jump shot? His jump shot. He got, you know, no, no, knows. No, that's, hey, that's too much. His, that's too much. His jump shot, man, man, he can't do nothing. It goes above the backboard, man. This dude had got no flick of the wrist. Like he's got nothing. That's too you much. Know? No, I, but but to say, I think um, there are some anger management issues there. That's permissible. Mm. You know, I, I would be concerned about that. Mm. You know, there are some anger management issues there. I'd be concerned about that. Um, preparedness for you know the financial obligation of marriage. I have some concern. I, I, I have some. I I'd inquire about that if I were you. Yeah. And then just leave it at that. You don't have to disparage anybody to tell the truth about somebody. If, and 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 if you know one of the interesting things that it got to the point where these things can get very, very dangerous and people don't realize if it can be just, if we're in just a not unfiltered space. Wish me luck. Wish me luck. You got a scarf around your neck, baby. Yeah. It's already unfiltered. Yeah, Allah, from that. Wish me luck. Uh, there was a, there was a, there was, you know, a friend of mine, man, who mm -hmm. got married. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, very, very, somebody, this is like years ago, mm -hmm. and he got married and he, uh, and I felt feel guilty. I did the nikah, oh, so I'm I'm always like, dang it, man, because this is where it gets. It didn't work out. Call me a month later. Hey, man, I don't feel kosher. So like, what's going on? He got SCD. Right, you got him, Muhammad Sallallahu. Yeah, and nobody, mm -hmm. nobody checked. Mm -hmm. Nobody whatever. Mm -hmm. So now you know we have to have an institutional response of mm -hmm. how we're checking on people's with with good adab, with the highest quality of vetting. 
Uh, oh man, that's controversial, man. That's you controversial. Know, we got to be that's very careful. careful. It's controversial, but it's a conversation it's that at some point. I, you know, I, I'd like, yeah, Joe. Blood test, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think, I think if it's rooted in a legitimate concern about health, I don't think anybody should be opposed to uh, that kind of, you know, blood work and getting a transcript. I think when, um, I think what concerns me about that is that it creates an environment of kind of deep inquiry into people's sexual past and history that could be, um, uh, I don't know, it, 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 there's something about it that rubs me the wrong way. You know, if, 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 if you ask someone, um, you know, and you know, subhanAllah, these conversations are quite relevant to me now. You know, my eldest daughter is 15. I'm not, I'm not speaking in just a theoretical vein. I'm thinking like, how would I broach that question to a young man? Um, I probably would just say, you know, history or, you know, I, I, the question needs to be asked. And whether or not we insisted on the blood test, I don't, I don't know, I, I, don't, I, I don't wanna create an, an atmosphere of distrust. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, this is true. I would, I would. You know what, may, maybe this conversation is really, it, it should be broadened mm. and generalized, just getting physicals. Just to know, you know, what kinds of disorders, diseases our children might be at risk for, chromosomal stuff, this, you know, like it might just, let's just get a blood test, let's just get a physical. And I think that way, it kind of removes it from this very specific focus on what well, a person says, I don't have any, I don't, I've never had experiences like that. Well, we, we need a test to verify. You know, yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if someone requested that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope the person will be up to, to, to offering it. But I, I do think that it does create this atmosphere that, you know, you need these tests because everybody could potentially have something to hide. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know something about that. I'm just I'm just wary of that. I'm just wary of that. But I don't know. Uh, yeah. He says, thus, our bad opinion of some profligate whose actions indicate his corruption is not prohibited. Mm -hmm. so if, you had a, if you have a bad opinion of someone who is proven to have engaged in misconduct of some kind mm -hmm. or to have committed a sin of some kind. Imam Maulud is saying, that's not, that's not for yeah. you to hold that, that yeah. bad opinion. What yeah. do you think? Uh, I, think, I think he's right. I mean, it makes sense in regard to the protection. This is something that we don't think about. Um, and I think what you alluded to earlier is the protection of the community and the protection of society, right? Mm -hmm. um, is what somebody have done. Do you entrust, and here, this is not shaminan. It's not all encompassing, right. right? That if somebody has a record of simply something of being very irresponsible um, with, uh, with accounts, with financial accounts, you would not put them in the position of a treasure of a community. Right. That's on you if you do that, mm -hmm. right? That's on you. Um, and those are very simple things. It's not prohibited to say, listen, dude, you're just not, you know, we, we don't feel comfortable with you in this. We position. don't feel comfortable with you in this position. We have another place perhaps you'd be better at. Right. You, that we want to push you towards. Right. Mm -hmm. As opposed to being like, nah, man, you just you're an idiot. You know, honestly, like that's not necessarily the appropriate approach. When we talk about prohibition and in Munkar, we forget about thinking about the tone of the prophet. So I said when I he did pro 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 prohibit something, mm -hmm. that it wasn't a violent tone. Right. In that mm -hmm. same. It's very interesting. In that same verse or the verse after. 
Surah, in, in Surah Luqman. He tells his son, you know, stay, be on the straight path of Surah Al-Mashi. And he said, this is really interesting. Because mm -hmm. I really want to know what you think about this particular verse. Mm -hmm. He says, and lower your voice. Indeed, the most disdained or negated voices, the voices that people don't listen to, are the voices of brazen donkeys. Mm -hmm. Right? That there is a way of prohibiting things. There is a way of calling to good. There is a way of sort of putting things in the rightful place. And as you know, the definition of oppression is shay'in fi ghayri mahallihi, to put something in its inappropriate place. Mm -hmm. That um, all of these have an adab and akhlaq towards them. Mm -hmm. And if we jump out of the confines of these, this akhlaq, then we get to problematic territory. But there's nothing necessarily wrong with prohibiting. And I think sometimes when I talk about brazing voices, that are screaming at each other, you're also thinking about how we're speaking to each other on mediums that are outside of like physical mediums, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so those are just things to be really mindful of. I don't, there's nothing ever wrong with, um, with, with, with being very aware of uh, a problematic history that a person might bring to the table in regard to that thing, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that they're a bad father. That doesn't mean that. Well, I think one of the important things when um, deeming someone yeah. to have fallen into error is to be sure that what you hold them accountable for, they're actually guilty of. Hmm. And I think that this well, is. What, a, what, what, do you, what do you mean? In the sense in, that for someone to be proven guilty of wrongdoing is not the same as speculation. Mm -hmm. You see, proving someone guilty. Even our opinion of the person involves either confession, admission of guilt, or we're talking proof, positive evidence that leaves no room for doubt. Yeah. And very rarely do people end up guilty in that way, mm. right? It's, it's rare that yeah. a person's wrongdoing is so public yeah. that they are clearly, indefensibly guilty. Right? Yeah. That's yeah. rare. So the first thing that I would do to contextualize Imam Maulud's statement is that people are very rarely guilty in that way. Right. Most of the time, in my experience, and I'm, you know, uh, old enough, inshallah. I'm 39, alhamdulillah. You find that there is some gray area that can be applied to the scenario, like, ah, uh, right? Now, if the person admits guilt, no, no. What I'm accused of, I did. Right. Then we have established, you yeah. know, their culpability and their wrongdoing. On the other hand, if it's something you're merely looking at, other people are speculating and opining about it, you still have to give that person a presumption of innocence. That's right. That's right. And I think we, I think we forget that. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not that, and this is why of and those kinds of, you know, like accusations, yeah. accusations can be so damaging. Absolutely. This is why libel is it a crime. It removes the reputation of that person. Even this is why instance. slander is a crime. Do you know that if somebody in this room just invented a lie about somebody here, that might be enough to damage their career, reputation, yeah, standing among their family, a complete lie. Sometimes you just, once it's out there, it's just... It's out there. And what, out did, what did the Prophet Wasallam say? It's enough to call, deem a person a liar if they spread everything that they hear. Mm -hmm. If they just give information away. Mm -hmm. It's enough to say that your... It's, in fact, our tradition attempts to flip the script. No, no, no. Their reputation is a problematic. In fact, it's your reputation for being somebody that spreads very allegations on people without any... Any, you know, uh, I remember, can I, can I tell you something really, I, I didn't realize this until later. Somebody said that there was a, a particular uh, a, a community um, that were in, in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Very good people. I know some of the people there. You know some of the people there. Many of you guys are familiar. And they would have like a barbecue with after Jamaa and sometimes, and, and it was co-ed. So guys and girls would have. Mm -hmm. And one brother man was sitting down. He's one of those brothers. One of those brothers. So he was sitting down with me. We're hanging out. And... You know, he's the did you hear brother? You know the did you hear? Mm. And did you hear? Right? Mm. 
And some some of those at some point you need to block those folks out of your out of your life. It makes it there's so much more color in the world after that. Mm-hmm. But uh, he said, man, man, that you know those those you know somebody mentioned, yeah, I'm going I'm going to such and such a place to barbecue, whatever. It's like, yeah, man, that's just a hookup spot. Mm-hmm. And I was like, word. And I was like, when I was supposed to do my, it's like I started in the middle. <laughs> yeah, that's where people are gonna come. Right of all the places in Subhanallah. This level. is a major problem to me. Yeah. So, but what people don't realize, you know, the Prophet says, a person says something. In the rajul yatakalim kalima, the word. La yubayinahum. Yeah, yubayinah. He doesn't clarify it, and it drags them further and further into the fire. Ma bayna maghrib wa mashr. Farther than the east and the west. That man, you just made an allegation on an entire community, without even thinking about. Without it. Without even thinking about it. You know. This, this idea, and I find this, unfortunately, among brothers and sisters that are uh, very practicing and very learned, very literate, very serious, this willingness to hold so much of our community in contempt, it's a sick thing. Man. You know, even like among the intelligentsia and the scholars, this idea of fetwa shopping, people talk about this person there, they're just fetwa shopping. I'm thinking to myself, subhanAllah, a person is trying to find some legitimate basis right. to do something that, yes, they want to do. Isn't that commendable? Mm. Now, I do know what you mean in the sense that there's no sincerity. But if there was absolutely no sincerity, they wouldn't need a fatwa. That's right. I Why would I need a fatwa? I would just do what I want to do. When, when someone is trying to find, yes, there is something that they want. There is something they'd like to secure. There's something they endeavor to do. And they're trying to find some authoritative scholarly voice that gives them license to do it. Yes, they should check their sincerity. But to dismiss them as a Muslim with no integrity, no sincerity, you do realize they're looking for a fatwa. That says a lot. That means they have some concern. That says a lot. That says a lot. If they had no concern, they wouldn't need a, they wouldn't need to do any fetwa shopping. They would just do nafs inventory. Yep, it's there. I'm doing it. But this 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 willingness to hold so much of our community in contempt. Look, we have issues, but I will maintain until my last breath that some of the best women, best men, best human beings I have ever met have ever been privileged to lay eyes upon are Muslims. There is still good in this ummah, and don't forget that. Sometimes people talk about the Muslims like, oh man, it's, it's so bad. Look at this and look at that. Look at our brothers, look at our sisters, look at the social media, look at the, look at the, look at the tyrants. Look at our politics. All of that's true. Yeah. But there is still a lot of good in this ummah. Man. And I, and I, you know, in that verse, Kuntum khayra ummatan ukhrijat linnas, this community is the best community drawn out of, you know, humanity for what humanity. I st- I'm crazy enough to believe that. Huh? No, I'm not. And crazy I, hold on. Yeah. I was telling, I did a, I did a wedding on, uh, Sunday, I officiated a wedding. Officiate just sounds like I was wearing a striped shirt or something like that with a whistle, but I was the officiate at a wedding. <laughs> and uh, it was a white American brother marrying into an Indian American family. And I told him, I said, you know, I've seen a lot of this community, this Muslim community. I've seen the best of this community. I've seen the worst of this community. <laughs> and mashallah, you're marrying into the best of this community. Allah, Allah. Alhamdulillah. But yeah. when I talk about the goodness that remains in the ummah, I'm not saying this with rose-colored glasses. I've experienced racism in this ummah, classism in this ummah. I've been personally insulted by members of this community, mm-hmm. stolen from by members of this community. Right? And still, if you, you know, I, I tell, you know, sometimes me and my friends, we get on the phone and we'll start talking about the problems with the community and this and that and this and that. And I say, okay, post-apocalyptic scenario. You have to pick somewhere in Chicago that you're going to go where you think you're going to feel secure. Where are you going to go? Devon or Bridgeview, that's where I'm going. <laughs> that's where I'm going. It's like, hey, look. Hey, man, I'm just, I'm just being real. 
<laughs> post-apocalyptic scenario, you have to pick somewhere that you're gonna feel safe. You, your family, every where you gonna go in Chicago? Where's you? <laughs> the Muslims are there, man. Yeah, where, where you gonna go, Devon? I'm just telling. You, I mean, and it's not that I'm looking through rose-colored glasses. There are big problems in those communities, but I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Yeah. I can can I just conclude with the story real quick, inshallah? And then we'll, we'll open and we'll short q and With this, I'm short, inshallah. Amir is very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very, very, Alhamdulillah. very uncomfortable. Alhamdulillah. We've gone over time. Amir is very uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, it's just to bring home, you know, one of the things I was, I remember leaving overseas for my first time overseas. And the, the city that I stayed in is known as, it's a laqab, it's nickname is a city of saints. And I'm walking with this one gentleman who's walking us to me, and he, just, he keeps using this word called wali, which is like a friend of God. And he was pointing to people and said, this person's a friend of God, this person's a friend of God. And wallahi al-adhim, you know what I'm thinking the whole time? Well, you tripping, dog, what you mean? I'm like, there's no way that all these guys, okay, dude, like, there's no way. Like, there's no way. <laughs> like, bro, you're high, bro. I was like, I was like, dude, you high as a kite, dude. Yeah, sure. I was like, man, you know, you, get, you know, can't get stoned, man. All, I love people, bro. You know, I thought he's one of these guys. So it was a, uh, so um, so we're walking down, and the next day, I was sitting with a teacher of mine who have, who has passed away since. Yeah, yeah. Um, passed away. He was 100. Wallahu well, alam. He was over 120 years old when he passed away. Subhanallah. Yeah, see the ayeshi and Wallah al 124. You had, you had. I was like, you had, you say, you had. I might have said something. There was something in the air. I don't know what it was. It was something. Um, and uh, he, uh, I remember sitting with him. He was, he was blind at the time. And, uh, you know, I asked him, he was, he was a, a black scholar from, from, from the Saharan desert. And I asked him, Shay, can I, can I just ask you a question? He said, I said, how do you have a friend of God in every? And we don't have any friends of God where I come from. And it's the first time I've ever seen upset. He said, Ittaqillah. He said, Fear Allah. He said, Fear Allah. And I was like, Okay. Mm. I was like, right, Like what? You know, Allahumma ja'ali min mutaqin. And then he says, Qala Rasulullah, the Prophet said, So I said, Fi Sanad. Um, so no 40 people amongst my community gather except amongst them is a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's more than 40 people in this room, right? Totally. Oh, yeah. No 40 people gather amongst one of them is a friend of Allah, high ranking person of Allah. And I asked them, but we don't know who they are. Like Allah, like how are we supposed to do it? Because Allah says, I've declared war on the one that has hostility towards. He said, that's a secret because this is the default of the believer. And I remember I was going through some stuff at work very recently, not too long ago. And where do you work? In terms of, I, I work at a- With, with, with Muslims. With, with Muslims. Muslims. I work with Muslims at a particular institution in Chicago, um, in, in, the, in, in, hey, in the Chicago. You're making it sound like it's notorious, man. It's just a Muslim can secondary the, school, can man. I plead the fifth? Can I plead the fifth? Are we good? <laughs> dang, dang, I'm sorry. Man, hey, listen, man. Listen. <laughs> Any talib, mashallah. I come here for still feel safer. But I was, you know, doing so, so <laughs> and you know, things sort of, you know, how Muslim institutions be—they give brothers a hard time sometimes. You know, what I'm saying there's this, yeah. sometimes, you know, there's this whatever. And I was talking to our brother Taki. Wallahi, without hesitation, he said, "Amen." He me roll up. Without hesitation, he said, "Tell me right." Wallahi, you, you remember this was like last week. He was like, "Hey, how, how can we make this work?" And the fact that he just said that, wallahi, like, all my problems just went away. The fact that he was just like, hey, man, blood in, blood out. I got mm. your back. Let's do it. Mm. What do what you, what you need me to do? How you, how you want us to take care of this? Do you want to come? Just if we just want to, just if you want to roll, you know, sometimes if you just want to roll deep, you just want to roll deep, inshallah, you know, just make sure you're good. To me, visit. He mm. just told me that. And I hung up the phone and I was like, man, dude. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Just to know that you're in a community when people have your back mm -hmm. and won't throw you under the bus, let alone drive the bus and run you over. Um, that's mm -hmm. a very healing factor. And I think, um, you know, we ask a lot to make us amongst I mean, a community. And, and, that and, you know, uh, the Muslim community is made up of human beings. Man. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Um, and uh, to my sister, especially, mashallah, good to see you again. Uh, just be prepared to, um, to exercise, you know, great forgiveness and great mercy when we make mistakes, because we're just people, you know, that recognize that we're seeking God's forgiveness and his mercy. And um, I realized that some people, you know, convert to Islam, like I converted to Islam. And if everybody in the Muslim community is not representative of the highest ideals of Islam with regard to you know, racism or sexism or, you know, uh, bad interpersonal skills or, you know, sometimes we feel like, I just, I just can't stand these people. I just, they just get on my nerves. But no, man, I mean, we, we, you know, and don't place yourself anywhere that's unsafe, but part of our spiritual development is learning how to forgive people, learning how to look past their mistakes learning how to embrace them in spite of their flaws. So, أقول لكم لهذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, time for like, what, two questions? Barely. Um, we had questions. We had, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to get through the two questions that we have online and do one question in the space. I apologize. We're short on time. What group came in? Um, and I, and I, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but also we have an obligation, inshallah, to prayer. Um, one of the questions that they have online is, uh, how do you balance covering the mistakes of your brother and sisters from times when things need to be called out, like acts of injustice or abuse? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Back to that criterion. If the person is just doing something that they're harming just really uh, themselves, then you don't have to you know, call them out. In fact, you should, you should cover their uh, wrongdoing. But if the person is harming someone else, this has to be called out and it has to be, you know, uh, stopped. It has to be prevented. You know, um, nobody ever came to the Prophet والسلام, complaining of abuse to have him say, oh, just be patient. Oh. Like this? <laughs> You know, so if somebody is being harmed by someone, then we have to we have to stand up for justice. If somebody is engaging in self harm, then we have to counsel them, pray for them, uh, talk to them in private. We don't have to make that public. The second question is: the man who slandered Aisha was punished, but later was forgiven by Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr continued to be generous towards him, toward, uh, uh, towards him afterwards. So, uh, so where are where is the element of forgiveness? Why do we continue to punish by ignoring whatever good people have done? <laughs> But you, you can you can address the question. Yeah. Um. Sorry, Bismillah. Um. So, the Mista, the man that that spread the rumor. But there were many the, people spreading. They the were rumor. spreading. But this particular verse, right? Allah Would you not want Allah to forgive you? Um. This is the verse on Mista, who is a very destitute man, who is a relative, um, who was very ignorant, and he didn't he didn't come up with the rumor. He spread the rumor, unfortunately. Um through his own ignorance. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr was sponsoring him in his life and making sure he had food on the table in a shelter above his head. That, and if he cut that off, this man would have been, would have been over for him, right? So the question was not necessarily that they were now these buddy-buddy, that he took it upon himself as the bigger man or the bigger woman to, to make sure that this person wasn't, he's still a Muslim, he still sh shouldn't starve. Like you shouldn't be in that state. Um, and, you know, one of the uh, uh, people that uh, um, spread the slander was a blind man. And he comes to the, say the Aisha after the passing of the Prophet وسلم, And he knocks on her door and she actually wasn't, he, he comes in the house and he was blind. And he, she had a little bit of a, like a pinch. Mm. Like, you know, you were, you were a part of that. You were a part of that a little bit. And she writes a poem and she's in the poem. He says, you know, wa, where he swears by. Wa bil al -walid, wa walid wa anta ya 
that I swear by the, the oath, the, the honor, and I, I'm, I give myself ransom to the honor of my fathers, my forefathers, and on top of that, you, O Messenger of Allah, he's talking to the Prophet, and he's presenting this poem, and she just breaks down and crying, and they said, she's like, she just gives him a ton of gifts and leaves him to be, and one of her friends says, you're going to just give him gifts after what he did to you? She said, man, just because of what he said about Rasulullah, that's enough to, that's enough. Like, that's enough. I'm good with that. So um, there was a clear retribution to Abdullah bin Ubay, the one that started the rumor, the chief of the hypocrites. But to recognize that people are not, well, we're just going to go after everybody now. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to go after every, we have to go after one by one by one by one. No, you go to the source, you recognize that source. There was a deep investigation. And then inshallah, if you have it in your heart to forgive other, you know, um, um, other believers um, because of their weakness um, and our own weakness. Inshallah. And we can, we can delay Maghrib no more. So please close us and do us. لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له ملك له الحمد وله كل قدر وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما عدد خلقك ورضا نفسك وزنا تعشق مدات كلماتك اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا أغفر لنا والذين سبقونا في الإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلة للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم ربنا جعلنا مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريات اللهم تقبل دعاء اللهم أغفر ذنوبنا ولوالدي والمؤمنين يوم يكون الحساب وصل الله على سيدنا محمد والآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله